Professor of Architecture, University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. Whenever I think of something to say, Khan takes the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> and when there's nothing to be said, Khan says it too. Yeah, but his silences leave me in a cold sweat. It's when he talks that I'm baffled. Where's the logic? He has his own logic, his own order. Take his words, take his silences, and you get the exception. That's calm. I must reflect on the, on the uh, circumstances. Uh, the mystery of circumstances, which uh, leads a man into, into paths which he could never anticipate before they happen. This certainly happened to me because I was uh, to be a painter. There was no question about it until my last year in high school when a course given on architecture just hit me so strongly as something that I wanted to be associated with. The course was given on the earliest architecture, Greek, Roman, Romanesque, Gothic, Renaissance. I felt a great happiness that I had no question as to what my career would be. I had no idea, of course, of modern architecture. Now, though we are living in the field of modern architecture, I feel a closer association to these marvelous examples than I do to any of the examples today. And it's uh, constantly in my mind, uh, as, as a reference, I say to this architecture, how am I doing Gothic architecture? How am I doing uh, Greek architecture? anybody who knows Louis Kahn to talk about him objectively because he's such a lovable old rascal but in fact Kahn's objective achievement in American architecture has been enormous it's not too much to say that starting in the 1950s he began to redirect it and he remade it and he remade it or began to remake it according to very solid principles first of structure and secondly of function the other thing he did and maybe even more than that, in redirecting and remaking American architecture was that he trained a whole generation of students. More than any other really first-rate American architect, Kahn has been a great teacher. And out of him has come a whole generation which is changing things. We used to parade the streets and see the buildings arise in, in, because the, the projects for building new buildings in Washington became very, very strong. And we noticed they had great trouble with starlings, the, the, the birds, you know, that, that uh, defaced the buildings. The birds would follow cornices lines, anything to project it. And they, of course, they had cartouches, you know what a cartouche is. Of course, they had a great shield, you know. And the birds would follow the shield, you see, like this. And they would be on the cornices, or on the dentals, in the dentals. And so the, the talking about how we would eliminate certain ornaments, which was, of course, was completely modern, you see. How we would introduce modern architecture, because the birds are telling us how, you see? <laughs> to eliminate this all this structure, it was really just plenty of fun. His father was a craftsman in stained glass in Russia. His mother, a harpist. As a very small boy, Khan was badly seared when hot coals he was carrying home in his apron flared up in his face. America never they built consciously housing for people. They just were built by builders. In 1905, the family emigrated from Russia to Philadelphia. There they lived in profound poverty. The immigrant son was gifted in many ways, mainly as a musician and painter. 
And I think a work of art is the making of a living thing. Khan wants to find a city as a place where a small boy, as he walks through it, may see something that will tell him what he wants to do his whole life. Philadelphia was such a city for Khan. Nothing must be mandatory. Everything has to be inspired. Khan had good teachers. He soon became the best renderer in Philadelphia. And he studied the character of a steamboat, say, with the same absolute objectivity that he devoted to a cathedral. It is my belief that all living things have consciousness, that a leaf wants to be a leaf. Khan came to revere Walter Gropius. He also came, as he once said, to live in a beautiful city called Le Corbusier. And he gathered momentum for the severe urbanity of his first job on his own at the age of 53. This art gallery was Khan's first mature building. It's also the first modern building at Yale University. A good many of us think it's better than any of the others that were built later. At the same time, it's a, it's a very archaic, a way a rather primitive building, as befitting, I think, Khan's beginning. In it, the, the functions were simplified down to simple loft spaces. An emphasis was on the structure. A structure which uh, Khan wanted to be as solemn and repetitive and demanding, uh, in a sense, as possible. It was designed as a space frame. I think the influence of Buckminster Fuller can be felt there. It wasn't a true space frame as it was finally constructed, but the ceiling does have that quality of spreading uninterruptedly and being stable in all three dimensions, which is characteristic of the space frame. And then it's supported by these big, widely separated piers, and the walls were originally of simple concrete block. They weren't white the way they are now. The, these white walls represent the attempt of a later gallery administration to make it look like the Museum of Modern Art, which is not what Kahn had in mind. What Kahn wanted was a kind of austere uh, environment with what the 19th century architects would have called a reality of its own, repetitive and stern, of a man-made environmental order within which the works of art would stand out with a special intensity as uh, embodiments of the human act. Kahn, between 53 and 1961, created a whole new set of forms. First, in the Trenton bathhouse of 1955, he broke out of the box. The Yale Art Gallery was enclosed within a box. A good deal the way Wright had done before by crossing two axes in space and then by gathering the utilities in special small spaces at the intersections of the axes. And then finally, in the Richards Laboratories at the University of Pennsylvania, at about 1960, he brought that precast, bony, concrete structure up into a marvelously systematic and lucid order. But maybe the functions weren't too well served there. Uh, light, for example, uh, blazed into the interiors. There was no sun protection. But if you come next, in the early 60s, to the church in Rochester, there all the shapes derive from a perception of function, especially from the reception of light into a building. And Kahn, he doesn't like glass, he doesn't like metal or frames or skeletons. He's fundamentally an artist who likes to work with archaic materials. So the great arches and the great tied together circles of those buildings on the subcontinent both enjoy local techniques and create out of them a great, abstract, international, austere grandeur. The library at Exeter is a bland little box that conceals within itself complicated lighting effects reminiscent of those of Piranesi but also recalling Khan's own work at Dhaka. When you uh, talk about buildings or streets or spaces, you talk about them almost as if they were uh, alive, as if, you know, as if they were living things, organic in some fashion. 
Why don't you describe one the way you would describe a person or... I sort of think that what the man does is a chunk, you see, of man. It is, uh, it, and the consciousness is uh, natural for me to give a consciousness, let's say, to a room. As though the dimensions of the room and you in it is a, has a rapport, as though this, the, uh, the, uh, uh, so no speaking is involved, you see, it just has a rapport. An architect is a composer. Truly, his greatest act is that of composing and not designing. If you think of the Parthenon being made of columns and spaces in columns, you can say the columns are, are no light and the space between the columns is light. Stephen Douglas's inspired statement about architecture, which induced me to think of it that way. Actually, he said, what slice of the sun does your building have? And I added, of course, what slice of the sun enters your room? The sun never knew how great it was until it struck the side of the building. In other words, you see, the sun, the sun goes along. Man makes something. The sun is surprised. The importance of a drawing is immense because it just simply, it, well, it's, it's, it's the architect's language. Even the drawing which, this looks like a flower, for instance, this looks like, like a canoe. It doesn't make any difference. The mind makes it what it wants to make it for the purpose of discussion. So therefore, the drawing is very valuable. And I know this, you see. Which part, which part do you keep? Which part can you throw away? Put it that way. See? I think you'd keep this. And, and I would keep one of these links. Yes. In keeping one of the links, you are saying that this link, because of its dimension, has a certain potentiality. And what I put in, you see, can be of, of, uh, Real value, if left. This is the Mellon Center for British Art and British Studies in New Haven. It's an early version of the project, and I thought, Lou, you might like to discuss it. Yes, I would like to. Um, let me point out two features of this building. These end structures are the mechanical towers. They contain all the mechanical equipment, which is hooked up with the building in general. They are made to be outside, to develop its own shape instead of it being buried in some undistinguished area in the basement. They're brought out into the open. Another characteristic is this point, a joint, was necessary in the middle because of the expansion uh, of a building of that length, the entire length. Instead of trying to conceal this joint, I actually made it two buildings at that point to dramatize the joint. This made two openings. So I better remove the model to explain it better. This can go up easily. This here, let me remove this. Now you can see it. This is the enclosed street, and it connects up with the entrance on Chapel Street. These two openings you see there connect to the interior street, and this is a shopping street, and it has protection above. The stairway you see would be the, the stair entrance, of course, to the, to the gallery itself, and also the books of the Mellon Center. Uh, in in a, the original studies I made for Mellon, there, in a sense, were instruments outside which looked, or will look, like something independent with, let's say, one here of a different nature, which is actually the supply of air, the exhaust of air, the machinery that goes into making the air the way you want it on the interior of the building, which I haven't yet drawn, as a matter of fact. Now comes the structure of the building itself, which ties in with it, and there is the building. I have to abandon these because of the excessive cost of them, although I think I'm abandoning something which has a meaning in the expressive possibilities in buildings. At the um, Salk Institute, 
you handled it differently uh, again, it seems to me you made the mechanical spaces, uh, spaces in between the laboratory yes. floors, yes. and they become, again, right. separate elements. And this is, I think, very beautifully expressed in Salk, in that you have, really, you might say, a room, a laboratory of pipes, and a laboratory for experiment, and then a laboratory of pipes, which you can feed downward or upward, you see. But this space is big enough, uh, just, as, just as tall, actually, as the space where the experiments are made. Uh, since controls have to be made on very small areas in a laboratory in which the temperature is very high in this case and very low right next to it. And it all comes from what Dr. Salk called the, the mesokinal space, you know. Uh, we, this serves the body, so to speak. And this, see. This, this actually is the service of the body, and this is the body itself. Dr. Saul listened very closely to my uh, speculations, you know, and uh, theories about how I would approach a building. He listened uh, more carefully to me than I did to myself. I can say that he is just as much a designer of this project as myself. Sort of the integration of the means, which, which tends to have one part of the building and another part of the building sympathize with each other, help each other be themselves. In the um, Olivetti plant, um, it seems to me that you made a kind of a false ceiling of light and then had all the mechanical stuff above that, between it and the actual roof structure. Is that correct? Well, the, the false ceiling is only a, is, it's a ceiling of light, so you look right through it. Right. It isn't as though it were covered. No, quite. No. It's, well, it's quite the light open. must be close to the work. Yes. See. And then everything that serves in the way of, of um, conveyors, and other piping is above the level of the lights. And it's all, all open, of course, to view. And also the window in the Olivetti factory is above you. So the service of a building is gradually reaching a, a high, such high cost as to equal half the cost of a building. Yes. And everything is done to try to conceal that half of the building. I believe that we must give it a rightful expression. And I can say that if we weren't able in our structures of the future to isolate the instrumentation, or you might say the equipment of, of the mechanical, as though it had its own aesthetic existence, and that of the spaces have its own, that we would free the building of all the subterfuges we use to conceal the services of a building. Get that. They'll never no, get that. Because they don't have two things. No. Do Sometimes you get that if you have uh, the material casting a shadow, well, a pattern very close, which we don't have. My feeling is that it's better to scatter them because it'll keep the curve better. I think the, the curve is somewhat broken also by reason of the lines being straight. I think it might there, it might right. be better. You see, the curve might hold the curve better. I think we'll really be making our decision. Line, we'll yeah. really be making our, our decision on the quantity of holes. Because one has smaller holes but more, and the other looks too much like black metal, like Rick says, with a bunch of holes in it. And what we're looking for is an overall pattern. That's what makes it different. I think also that Kelly is concerned that the eye will travel on a 
well, curious. Uh, I mean, I can he make calls my, it a I diagonal. On this too. I mean, sure, you can. can. My, well, you can. You can. Like for example, what happens now? You see, you see that you see the shadow on the yoke right there because it's so close. Beginning our study of the bicentennial celebration, the words of a young, remarkable person comes to mind. Edmund Burke, in Parliament speaking on behalf of the colonists, said, surely, the spirit of freedom England gave to the Americans. But he said, in warning, that the chapel of freedom is in America. This is what really is worth expressing in the bicentennial exposition. The plans which each of you will present must reflect these thoughts. Uh, stay away from, from uh, some enlarged photographs which shows George Washington about five times as big as it has to be. You can stay away from this. You can, you can decide that that's phony. Even just a mere celebration of the, of the basic human values, of, of just coming together or having a giant clam bake or something like this. There's something in, in the simplicity of that that yeah. not all tied up into, into organization. Maybe, uh, in a sense, this brings us back to uh, uh, when we talked at the beginning of the year about uh, uh, searching for uh, an agreement. Okay, there's no guarantee that anybody will come to any agreements. No guarantee whatsoever. But what you said about a clam bake is very fine. It's a party. I really want to have people say, you know, I think the United States is a pretty good guy. If you agree that this is, could be fun and could be good, both very good things, I, I, I'd like to, like to say, I'd like to recommend this project to you. Is there anyone who doesn't agree with it and would not work with it? The mind is open to the strength of architecture that can propose a space without purpose. And there would be a feeling amongst all that the purpose could be found. That certainly would not be accepted in professional circles as meaning anything, really. The suggestion of something which, which, which simply has that quality that would make others want it, even though the purpose is not known. So with this error, a building full of error, one can find more than a building in which everything that has been done before has been satisfied. You have a space below the, uh, a, 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 the central area, which I don't know the, the meaning of exactly. What is that? Well, I felt the need to have the access to the, to the other spaces at, at a number of places here so that no one does have to walk, walk by. Right. So then what happens are that, that people begin to come together at these points. But the final realization uh, uh, comes where all of the elevators essentially open up into this space. Now, you haven't selected a building in the exposition, but you have selected that of an entrance to the exposition. And it is from such attitude that one can also find other attitudes in regard to the exposition itself. Because once this could be accepted as being a worthy thing, the mystic courage of another worthy thing can come too, with the same kind of reasoning as is employed here. Now, for one moment, I would consider the absolute financial feasibility of this. I'd just say that if it isn't financially feasible, 
then the financing associated with such things are wrong, you see. Because it, 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 it's in some way the thinking in this direction, you see. Maybe it doesn't apply to this, can apply to somewhere else, but the thinking is, is, is architectural, in my opinion. It's program architectural. The right thing done badly, Louis says, is always greater than the wrong thing well done. And because of that, he, he prefers good questions. And he says a good question is better than the most brilliant answer. He's always searched throughout his life, and clearly he continues to do so. Most of all, one recognizes in him a man. One knows that uh, he's grown very slowly and, and solidly, fully in terms of human life. He's grown a little bit like an olive tree, which he slightly resembles. Very slow in growth and bearing for the generations to come. 